Andrew, it's Stephen. How are you? Hey, Stephen. How are you, my friend? Nice to hear your voice. How's everything? Good. Uh, so is this, I can see myself, but is this audio only? Should I just concentrate on my voice? It's audio only. You can take off your pants if you want. Nice. Hi, everyone. This week on Forward, we have a special crossover episode with Freakonomics Radio. Maybe the biggest natural resource in the world, worth more than all the petroleum and other mineral products combined, etc., is the surplus human capital that's just sitting around in just about every human. The following is my full, never-before-heard interview with writer and host Stephen Dubner about the economy of the future, time banking, and how we can create a human-centered economy for all. I hope you enjoy it. Okay, first of all, just say your name and what you do. I am Andrew Yang. I'm an (laughs) all-around interesting (laughs) bon vivant. (laughs) (laughs) When you're living your bon vivant life, is it focused on politics anymore or not necessarily? I just try and make good things happen. Uh, Politics is one way to make good things happen sometimes, but there are other ways um, on the board of various nonprofits. I have some business interests that are doing wholesome things. Okay, let's talk about, I don't know what you call it exactly, time banking, time dollars, social credits, et cetera. What's your favorite phrase? I've been using multivariate economy, uh, but... but (laughs) (laughs) That is sexy. Yeah, multivariate economy. Okay. But uh, but we can use time banking. It's probably the most popular... Well, no, it's your, I mean, it's your brain and mouth. I don't want to control it. But so, so we want to talk about multivariate economy, you're saying? Or, you know what I called it um, in uh, the war of normal people is the human centered economy. We can go with human centered economy. I'll try and keep making that a thing. <laughs> no, I, I mean, however you want. All right. But let's, um, first of all, just describe the, the concept generally. And then I want to get into when you first learned of it and what you thought about it. So first, let me preface this by saying I'm convinced that AI is going to change a lot of things in our economy, and it's going to make it harder and harder for a lot of people to compete. It's getting stronger, faster, smarter, more powerful. And I joke, but it's true. We are not. We are lucky if we stay the same in any given week. And and so um, if you play out the way this is going, we already live in maybe the most extreme winner-take-all economy in the history of the world, it's going to become more extreme with the advent of AI and associated technologies. So if you want people to still live awesome, fruitful, happy lives, there are a couple of choices. And the human-centered economy is about saying, look, my wife who's at home with our son who's autistic, that has immense value. Maybe the market right now does not give that appropriate value. If someone is painting a mural in their neighborhood and beautifying it, that has value that maybe doesn't show up in our current system. If someone shows up to a nursing home and volunteers, if someone is tutoring children, if someone is making people around them healthier and more active, like all all of these things have positive values. And so the goal would be to build an economic system that rewards people pursuing these activities and making it so that more people have structure, purpose, fulfillment, and a role they're excited about that right now would not get properly recognized or rewarded in our current monetary economy. Great. And and what share of, if, if it could be measured, what share of, let's say, GDP would you like this entire separate version of the economy to comprise? You know, I would think of it as a parallel instead of a percentage of GDP, but our current economy is around $24 trillion. And if you think about how much we could benefit in education and nurturing and health and wellness, I mean, we're spending maybe 17 or 18 percent of that $24 trillion on our health care right now. So let's call that $4 trillion. And we all know that we could generate immense value if we all took better care of ourselves and had preventative care and and everything else. So just in the healthcare space, you can see trillions of dollars, environment, trillions of dollars, education, trillions of dollars, arts and creativity, I would argue, you could also get up to that level. So you can uh, imagine uh, something that gets up into the tens of trillions of dollars that mirrors the size of what we consider right now the, the economy. 
Yeah. So what got me interested in this, and you and I have talked about this outside the show a couple times, was reading the work of this fellow Edgar Kahn, who died recently, who who wrote a book whose title really, really stuck with me. The book stuck with me, but the title especially it was called No More Throwaway People. And what really impressed me, but it took a long time to really get it. And now I feel I really get it. But it dawned on me that um, maybe the biggest natural resource in the world worth more than all the petroleum and other mineral products combined, et cetera, is this surplus human capital. It's just sitting around in just about every human. And it seems, you know, a shame not to give that and not to to take it because that's what humans are, are pretty good at. So that's what drove my interest is really thinking about it from an economic standpoint. Like there's all this, you know, value locked up in people that they would like to give and that it could be um, it could generate value for them as well. That's where my interest came from. What about your interest? What brought you to this idea in the first place? I also love the Edgar Kahn time banking example. I do use it in my book, The War on Normal People, as a positive vision. There have been college towns and other communities that have adopted time banking. uh, But the core of it is that we all have value. We all have things we can contribute. There are ways that other people can help us. And one of the main things that we're combating really is a sense of isolation and desolation and loneliness. And so if you want people to reach out to each other, to help each other, to connect to their neighbors uh, and folks in their community, this would be a very, very powerful way to, to make that happen. And in my opinion, there has to be some kind of mechanism that encourages us to help each other, as opposed to right now saying, hey, we're going to reward all sorts of other behaviors. And then if you do these <laughs> altruistic things that, uh, you know, like that great for you, but, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I could imagine countless religious organizations and food banks and volunteer programs hearing us talk about this and say, hey, what, what do you think we're, we're doing? What do you think we've been doing forever? So how is this different Hopefully it supercharges many of those organizations and communities. I mean, one of the reasons why I loved talking up what universal basic income would do is that if I put this money in your hands, some of it goes to your church or synagogue or mosque. Some of it goes to the local nonprofit. Some of it goes to the local arts organization. And so you wind up turbocharging some of those orgs. But if you do time banking or the human-centered economy at scale, you wind up having a lot of that energy flow through existing nonprofits and religious orgs because in many ways they're the best situated to be able to encourage and monitor and benefit from more people getting out and doing more things for other people. This podcast is sponsored by Helix Sleep. I've always been a sleep guy. I believe that if you sleep better, then your day goes better. And Helix Sleep has been an awesome partner and sponsor to this podcast because I actually love the heck out of their product. I took their personalized Helix Sleep quiz and was matched with a Dawn Firm mattress because I wanted something that supported me and I sleep on my back. So if you don't know how you sleep, You can just make answers up on the Helix Sleep Quiz. They won't even know that you made it up. And then they'll send you a mattress to your door that you will have a 100-day free trial. Yeah, you can have it for three months and send it back, but you won't want to send it back because you're going to love it. You're going to sleep better. Our Helix Sleep mattress is my kid's favorite mattress, even though they did not take the quiz. (laughs) They just get out of that thing and say, you know what? This mattress is the best one in the house. Don't take my word for it. It's a top pick from GQ and Wired Magazine. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash yang. That's helixsleep.com slash yang. This is their best offer yet, and it won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. Get a new mattress for the fall. Yeah. Okay, talk about the mechanics of it, how it would actually work. Maybe just give one example, um, how this human dollar, let's call it, gets you know spent and shared. What are the tasks that create the value? 
who gets the ultimate value and so on, how to maybe prevent fraud. I can imagine that's the first thought of a lot of people, especially people who listen to Freakonomics Radio, because, you know, we do like to point out that many proposed solutions to many problems are immediately um, ruined by the small number of people who take advantage of them. So walk me through maybe a good example. Maybe you're the one that starts this chain reaction. How does it work? Sure. So uh, I put myself out there and say, hey, guys, uh, I'm not good at a lot of things, (laughs) (laughs) but I am good at tutoring kids in middle school math and reading. And so I'm going to put myself out there and say, if anyone needs a tutor for this, like, I'm going to be your your person. And you say, I'm offering X number of hours a week, or how does that work? Yes, I'm I'm offering uh, X number of hours a week. Here's where I'm located. And then if, if... you take me up on this and then I show up and then you sign off and say, yes, he actually did show up and he did a good job. And here's a picture of him with my child. And it's non creepy. (laughs) 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 Then, Then I will have earned, let's call it 20 human dollars. And then I have my human dollars and I say, well, great, what what am I going to do with these? And then I look around and say, you know what, like I could really use a home cooked meal because I'm terrible at that, which, by the way, is a pretty real example. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And and then there's someone that's like, I love to cook and I am happy to make surplus food. And uh, and then I will happily take those human dollars off your hands and then they take those human dollars and they have a set of things that they could use some help with. So if you can imagine it being a time barter system on steroids enabled by modern technology, that's a reasonable way to look at it. But the, the fun thing is that I can rack up human dollars and then use them to get what my family needs or what, what I would benefit from, or I can even gift them. And so then I can convey them to be like, hey, check it out. I earned these 100 human dollars tutoring. I'm going to give them to you. And then you can then use them. And this was where organizations and whatnot uh, come back in. Like you can use them for tickets to the Nets game, tickets to the art gallery, tickets to, you know, uh, uh, whatnot. And then you can wind up supercharging everyone's communal experience. So you and I have talked about this. We're, we're both enthusiastic about this idea, and we've talked about actually trying to make this happen on a bigger scale or stage. And granted, there have been a lot of people who've been doing exactly this on a small scale in many places over, over time. Um, can you just talk about what you see as the most fruitful way to set this up in terms of whether it should be a private-public partnership with government involved to some degree? Is it, you know, is it primarily a, a software platform or is it more of a of an in real life thing? Does it um, does it have a local focus or should it be national or even international? What do you see as the best structure? I think that it needs to be somewhat localized in scope um, so that you encourage more in-person, what they call IRL, like in real life interaction, get people out of the house talking to each other and helping each other. Traditionally, this sort of thing would be led with philanthropy, and then you would bring in various corporates, and then the last domino is government. Now, because you know that that's traditionally the way the, these things end up taking shape and growing. Um, but if you were to choose a particular location, let's call it New York City, for the sake of of this, then there'd be public officials cheerleading for it right and left because it solves a lot of the problems that they're most animated about. That, it, in my opinion, it's going to take this kind of mechanism to truly engage tons of people because, again, we want them to do, and they want to do all of these positive things, but right now there's not uh, an effective way for it to be rewarded, recognized, spotlighted, measured, etc. This podcast is sponsored by ExpressVPN. How did you choose which internet service provider to use? The sad thing is most of us didn't have much of a choice because ISPs operate a lot like monopolies in the regions that they serve. They then use this monopoly position to take advantage of customers, and yes, they even sell your data, your activities to advertisers and big tech companies, and you don't see a dime. That's why I protect my internet surfing and devices with ExpressVPN. When you use ExpressVPN, it's like a magic portal to a perfectly safe and anonymous internet. And don't take my word for it. 
This is the number one VPN service according to CNET. It's used by major companies all over the world. So stop handing over your personal data to ISPs and other tech companies who then mine your activity and sell off your information. Protect yourself with a VPN I trust to keep my privacy online. Visit expressvpn.com slash yang. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S vpn.com slash yang to get three extra months free. Go to expressvpn.com slash yang right now to learn more. So are you willing and committed to join me slash us for economics radio to try to actually make this work oh yeah the great collab <laughs> is beginning for the human centered economy time banking human dollars <laughs> we're gonna freaking do it because in my opinion that this really this and it sounds utopian to some people listening to this right now but one of the arguments i'd make which i believe to be true is that we're going to veer towards either star trek or mad max over time <laughs> and I don't know about you guys, but I'm a much bigger Star Trek fan. So if you want, and it was a quote from Buckminster Fuller that I think about just about every day. He said that the race between utopia and dystopia will be neck and neck down to the last minute. And so if we want good things for ourselves, our families, our communities, we have to actually build the mechanisms for those good things. And if we don't, then we kind of know which way things are going to head. So you can count me in 100%. Let's actually build this in real life so that people can experience it, point to it and say, people are good. We want this in more places. What would success look like to you in five years, let's say? Uh, success would be thousands of people living better lives and a model that other people say that's totally replicable. We can do that where we live and work. Now, what if I were to say, now I could I could counter that by saying, well, Andrew, you're also a political player. And the reason that so much money is drawn into politics is because there's so much leverage in the political system. Wouldn't it be better to focus on that, to remake the political system so that all the benefits that you want from this human dollar system were just there already. And you wouldn't have to recreate this whole second system to take care of it. In other words, set up the political system to make the economy more human centered in the first place. Why isn't that the best solution? Oh, I love that solution, too, Stephen. Uh, you know, we should definitely pursue that, uh, you know, and 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 I'm I'm working on that every day. But there's no reason why we can't demonstrate what's possible, given current technologies and what resources we have. Okay. Talk to me about Samarity. What is it and what's it hope? What what does it or did it hope to accomplish? So, so Samarity uh, is uh, an early version of what we're describing, which is we wanted to reward volunteers for doing awesome things and have corporations pay for these activities in, in various ways. And I think those mechanisms will be very much baked into what you and I build with this human-centered economy system. And happily, we actually have a tech platform that is there for the using. Mm -hmm. Now, from what I could tell from Samarity, if I were to help someone out, I would get some virtual dollars, call them, or, or credits. And then the way I would redeem them is through these corporate partners like a Starbucks who agree that it's worth it for them to reimburse me for doing a, a pro-social thing. But one could imagine that that could easily outscale Starbucks's appetite to reimburse. So how do you how do you work out that balance? You know, the, these corporates, what they do is uh, they say, hey, we'll offer a deal up for this many people or up to uh, like this dollar amount. Uh, and I imagine that's what we're going to find with our time banking system to Stephen, where we're going to go to Brian Moynihan and Bank of America and say, hey, do you want to get involved with this and like sponsor some good activities? And they, they'll say, we will up to... 100 or 1,000, 10,000 hours, and uh, the approximate value of rewards for that will be that this, and then they'll get to throw their name on it. I see. Okay. And then after that, but then, um, so I just need to have enough enough corporate power behind it to make the total reward pool pretty giant, though, if you want to cover, let's say, New York City. Yes? You think that's doable? 
Well, it's not like every person in New York is going to like uh, adopt. I think you're going to have some early. I mean, you know, we'll 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 take Come what on, we we'll get it early on. Um, but realistically, if we have again, I said thousands of people using this in a way that genuinely increases their day to day optimism and connectedness and everything else like that. That that's going to be a home run. And if if we succeed in interacting with people in that manner, then they're going to be major corporations that want uh, to be associated with it, have their names in front of people's eyeballs, show up to things and say, look, check it out. We generated a thousand volunteer hours uh, by, by working with the, the, and you know, we're going to need a catchy name uh, ASAP. So, uh, you know, I guess Yang freak is not quite right. Um, Freak a Yang. Yeah, no. So um, that'll just scare people off and have them running the other direction. Um, <laughs> so, so um, you know, we, we could call it time banking um, for the for the time being. Um, but uh, you can imagine corporations that wanting to get in front of like time banking New York in a very big way. Hey, all, if you know me, you know I'm not that handy in the kitchen and I have become a huge believer and booster of factor. Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals make eating a joy. It's so fast, you just pop that thing two minutes later and you are eating a restaurant-quality, healthy meal making you feel excellent about yourself. My favorite is the turkey chili with zucchini, and there is so much more to choose from. You never get tired of it. It fits any budget. It's fast, healthy. It is going to be the new factor in your life. Yes, I'm a fan. Head to factormeals.com slash yang50 and use code yang50 to get 50% off your first box and two free wellness shots per box while subscription is active. That's code yang50 at factormeals.com slash yang50 to get 50% off your first box. Get Factor today. It's going to change the way you eat. When you and I first spoke on this program years ago when you were running for president, you got into the notion of digital social credits, which is essentially a version of this. And there was a platform, and I believe we included a conversation with someone from that platform on on the episode, actually, although I'm not 100 percent sure that's true. How does this version that we're talking about today differ from that version, or is it essentially the same? It's essentially the same principle. It's people doing good things, getting credit for doing so, and then being able to exchange that for value in different ways. And that this is a, a not that different people have been trying to crack in, in um, different milieus. But, uh, you know, no one as cool as us has taken it on in this way, Stephen. Um, but, you know, there, there are also philanthropists that uh, I've talked to that are interested because they also see the writing on the wall in terms of how AI is going to impact things. Yeah. You once wrote to to me in an email, I think, you wrote, I'm convinced that the monetary economy is going to grind us up. And 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 you've argued that it, it really already has ground up a, a majority of people in this country and that a multivariate economy, caring and nurturing, arts and creativity, fitness and wellness, et cetera, is the only way out and will require multiple currencies to get right. In addition to what we're talking about today, what do you see as other currencies that do exist? What do you see as other pro-social behaviors out there that m- we might want to draft off of or even borrow from? Yeah, the best example I can use is that punch card at your local deli where you get 10 sandwiches and then you get the 11th for free. And you're like, oh, my gosh. And that that has a place of honor in your wallet. And, and you get really excited when you get close to the free sandwich. If you can imagine a version of the deli punch card for showing up to all sorts of things like that. That's the vision. Do you do you are you concerned that some people might think this is a, a Marxist idea and therefore not an idea that most modern Americans might embrace? Americans love points. Americans love rewards. <laughs> Americans love stuff. You know, and and the the, the another example I use from the Daily Punch Card is I, I have these reward points on my Amex, and uh, it's mesmerizing. Even though right now, I you know it doesn't cost them anything because I'm not going to redeem it because I'm hoarding for I don't know what I'm hoarding for. <laughs> but that that's really the core idea is that if you give uh, Americans 
cumulative rewards for doing awesome stuff, you'll see more awesome stuff. Yeah. Now, on this platform that we're envisioning, would it be anonymous or no? In other words, I need something and I've got I've built up a bunch of these time dollars. How does it actually how do I connect with that person or people and and um, and what happens if I know them or something like that? Most people are going to be uh, public and identified. Uh, and one of the the aspects of this is we are trying to build a community. You know, like you might not have any more information than you have on your Facebook profile, but they should know who you are. And I'm going to suggest that if I just had a question mark for my face and being like, I like, you know, babysitting, <laughs> tutor, people are going to be, like, <laughs> be like, hey, pass on that. You know, uh, so it, it's going to be folks that you, you might, if you know them, it's a plus, not a minus. So... I can imagine people who might be listening to this program in Denmark or in Japan or really many other countries and thinking, oh, these people are crazy. You have totally lost sight of the fact that this is the way we all behave in our societies, in our communities, in our families. This is the way life is lived or at least meant to be lived. What would you say to that criticism? I would say that uh, there are multiple ways to awesomeness and that if you figured one out that does not involve uh, these mechanisms, um, fantastic, more power to you. And, uh, you know, if, if we've got uh, America, this thing, <laughs> then, uh, you know, hopefully more power to us. Um, but, you know, like uh, I, I'd love people showing up for other people. Okay, so we'll we'll come up with some way for people to contact us as your team and my team start to really try to make this happen and build it out. Who who are the most important first three hires or participants, would you say, to to run this and set it up the way it needs to be set up? Oh, so much fun. Um, so we're certainly going to need some techies, and I have a line on on some folks to make the interface, you know, uh, both modern but also uh, adaptable because uh, there are going to be new use cases and, and needs that pop up all the time. Um, we are going to need a uh, community manager type, um, which is, I'm going to suggest, going to be the most wholesome positive job ever. Uh, and 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 then there there is going to have to be some corporate reach out and organization building and onboarding of resources. Um, so those are the, the three things that come to mind. Is that community manager something like a CEO or no? You know, I, I think you're going to wind up with multiple community managers, but the, the CEO is going to have their hands in all three of these buckets, uh, trying to make it more easy and usable, uh, trying to have stakeholders say like, hey, getting in front of these people is going to be the best thing you've ever done. And then trying to make it clear to folks like, look, this is just here to make your life better and more human and powerful and um, maybe reward you for things you're doing it already. So for someone listening who thinks, ooh, I might be the ultimate CEO for this new project, this is perfect for me, what should that candidate have in what characteristics or traits or desires would you say the ultimate candidate would have? I'd say that person is comfortable going into a a room of people in a community in Queens or Staten Island or Brooklyn and saying to them, hey, this is what we're doing and this is why you should sign up and this is why it's awesome. And then feel equally comfortable going into a room of marketing executives uh, or foundation grant writers and say, this is what, what we're doing and this is why you need to get on board. As, as quickly as possible. So the profile that comes to mind for me is someone who is has run a nonprofit would make sense. Someone who has had um, some kind of role in public service would also make sense. An entrepreneur would make sense. Those, those three profiles uh, appeal to me. If I were to rain on the parade a little bit, I might say, well, a lot of nonprofits are set up to, I mean, this is a cynical take, but set up to essentially either perpetuate themselves or to kind of inject a lot of warm glow into their participants and donors. And, you know, I want this to be run much more like an effective organization than the typical nonprofit. How do you find the person who's got the heart, but also the, I don't want to call it ruthlessness, but, you know, the business capability and the political capability to make it happen? I like it. Uh, certainly, you know, what. so I, I jokingly um, thought, like, let's give the person a term limit. <laughs> like, I like, get them out of there after a certain number of years. Um, but, but, but someone who's a growth operator and from the business world is, you know, a very appealing profile. I think that they'd be able to speak to 
um, some of the outputs and measurables we'd like to see. Is former senior government official a good background? I, I think for some of them, it would be a, a good fit. And then others, you would not want to hire. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you could name one person, and after this, I promise to let you go. If you could name one person, living or dead, imaginary or real, who would be the ultimate leader of this ultimate organization, who would it be? You know, I, I think that um, they would need to clone you and me and smash our DNA together and then have the person be younger and cooler than us. So it, 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 it's like uh, Andrea Dubner. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Okay, Andrew, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Stephen Dubner. If you want to listen to the recent episode about time banking on Freakonomics Radio, definitely check it out. And thank you for listening. Let's try and make things better for people.